Mm. Well, I thought we'd do this um, as we focus on more sort of thematic things, but um, there's obviously been quite a lot of news in over the week and various things. Um, but maybe the big thing at the start of the week was the, the collapse in oil prices. So I'll, I'll um, address that first. Um, the property companies uh, will carry on getting news about who's paying dividends, who isn't. So um, we'll um, talk, to that, talk to that. Uh, we'll just have a mini rant about Target Healthcare, but, um, which I, this is I quite like, but they've done something strange. Um, and then also I thought we'd talk about power prices because um, uh, we've seen uh, some news from uh, Renewable Energy Group. So, so oil prices first. The chart there is um, WTI um, and as we know, it's quite well publicised, um, prices dipped negative at the beginning of the week. Um, and now there's also been on downward trend for quite a while. Basically, as we know, the Saudis and the Russians got together and decided that they uh, weren't going to pay more, weren't going to cut uh, production. And um, now, even though they've made production cuts, um, there's still a huge glut of oil um, and storage is filling up. And um, we've got um, news this morning, I was uh, hearing that um, there is a fleet of Saudi tankers on their way to um, the US Gulf ports at the moment, uh, intending to basically fill the storage in um, available that's available in the US, um, which is obviously extremely bad news if you're producing oil in the, in the US and you've got absolutely nowhere for it to go. So that's going to be a huge political row, I think, as we. Um, go through this and that maybe that they, they try and turn those tankers away but the Saudis actually own quite a big refinery on the Gulf Coast so um, it may not be possible. Um, if you're through our infrastructure this is probably good news they've got um, six percent of their portfolio I think in a uh, business called Oyster Catcher which owns um, oil storage terminals in Rotterdam um, and it was one of their poorer performing investments last year um, because um, the, as the sort of economy seized up and there was less demand for um, tanker fuel, for, for, so well, shipping fuel, um, they, they saw um, the demand for their services fall. But actually, in all of this, I'd imagine the prices for storage are going to be going through the roof, and this is, they're probably making bumper profits in this. But it is, it is just 6% of the portfolio. Um, at the other end of the scale, we've obviously got a company that's very severely affected, which is Riverstone Energy. Um, it's mainly shale plays in the US, um, some Canada, Mexico things. Um, but it's already been uh, taking big haircuts to its NAV, um, even just uh, with going into the beginning of the year. They just announced the results this week, and there was a huge um, drop in the NAV. But um, they're now in sort of five voting mode and trying to board trying to say what to do next. It's got $211 million of cash. No, that's what it had, how much it had at the end of March. It's um, made commitments to fund some of its oil companies, oil investments, um, totaling about $135 million. So that's its sort of legal commitments. So there is some cash left over and the board is thinking about can we return this to shareholders? If they could return all of that um, gap, that would be quite a, a big chunk of money. The, the market cap of this thing now is only 128 million uh, pounds. But um, so, so you know, returning all that, all those dollars would actually make a big difference. Realistically, though, I don't know whether they will want to do that because it may be that even though they haven't actually made firm commitments for, for all that other money, they might want to use it to, to shore up a few of their investments from actually using the, the buffers. So we'll see what happens. I mean, we also don't know this sort of never ending theme as to exactly how it's going to play out in terms of um, rescue deals from the US government for these old plays. So uh, we'll wait and see. So that's oil. Um, on the property side of things, a um, couple of things that I thought were interesting, um, but we, we had, as I'm saying, quite a lot of news across the sector. Secure income REIT, 
Um, I think it's, yeah, 6.4% of its portfolio is exposed to Travelodge. Um, obviously, Travelodge's business has just stopped. Uh, well, well, I say that, but apparently they're putting up um, some homeless people in some of them, and I, I guess they, they're getting paid to do that. But um, Travelodge basically is not paying its rent, and Secure Income Re uh, said at the beginning of the week that it was going to basically go after Travelodge and, and pursue it for that. Um, and <coughs> Yeah, that's sort of normal course of business is what you expect. The secure income read statement was basically the lines of this is a, a big, once very profitable company uh, backed by some very big investors like Goldman Sachs. Uh, if they can't afford to pay the rent, who can? Um, so we don't see why we should suffer. Actually, what the um, government's come out and, and done yesterday, I think, or maybe, yeah, I think it was yesterday. Um, it said that they've passed a law saying you cannot, as a, a property company now, enforce the payment of rent through wind up orders and uh, statutory um, demands. So um, that means that securing income is a bit stymied in what you can do. Um, so it's, again, it's a quid pro quo thing. So what happens to a secure income rent and if it, if it can't collect that rent, can it, um, get some kind of waiver on, on its payments. And so we have to wait and see what happens. It's not the only one who's exposed to Travelodge. Um, it was kind of sort of popular trade. Um, NXI is, is one of the ones that um, has got a fair chunk of these things in, the, in its portfolio. Um, BMO, which uh, hands up I hold, um, has been a <coughs> pretty dreadful stock. That's, that's the chart for BMO in there. Um, it was already obviously quite low ahead of this. Basically on people worrying about its retail exposure. And it's not huge retail exposure though. I think um, the numbers I've got here, which I think are to the end of March, 16.9% in uh, retail warehouses and 11.1% in high street retail. So it's, it's one of the few uh, listed property companies that has got some high street retail. And, and obviously we do know that, so it's been hard out. Um, but this to me looked like a sort of a bit of an overreaction of the share price. Um, so it had a new NEV out um, this week uh, as at the end of March and the um, value is basically only um, marked down the NAV by 2.8%. Um, it connected 69% of its rents um versus about 94 percent last year so um yes it's suffering yes it's it's you know this is this is not um without its problems but it just seemed to me like the share price is a it's quite a big overreaction and the dividend is being paid at the moment it's obviously being kept under review to see what happens but um, we'll, we'll wait and see so so there may be some bargains in the property sector i'm not saying this is necessarily the, the one to go for but um worth a closer look maybe um, Target Healthcare REIT, um, I suppose the, its major concern is about the health of its, the residents in its homes. In its, in its homes. Um, it's confirmed again that, that less than 5% of its tenants have actually um, caught the COVID-19 virus. It's still quite a high number, obviously, in, in, in to the outside of care homes for elderly residents. It's, it's not great, but um, I think that is still much better than the industry as a whole from some of the anecdotal stuff we see in the media. Um, so from that point of view, it, it, it's, it's coping. Um, it's still quite comfortable that it, it's going to get all the rent paid to it that it's due. And so from my point of view, I was thinking, well, this, this is probably quite sort of a, a good investment. Um, but then the board has just done something weird, which um, they've just extended the manager's notice period. So, so basically, um, they're, they're making the notice period two years and they're also saying that, it, that you can't serve notice for at least a year so basically they've just guaranteed the manager three years worth of income and for no good reason I can't really understand why they want to do that it's it's one of these things that um, you never actually need to fire the manager unless they're doing really badly um, it's you know or, or, or the things being taken over um, and, and so it's hard, quite hard to 
fathom why the board thought this was a good idea. And if I was a shareholder, I would be kicking a big fuss about this, um, to be honest. But it's not actually um, something that shareholders get to vote on. They've decided it's, it's um, although it's a related party thing, it's, it's a minor thing and it doesn't actually deserve a vote. So um, still, if I was a shareholder, I think I would be stirring up trouble. So that's that one. Um, and then the other big one is power prices. So yeah, Renewable Infrastructure Group came out and said, um, we think that the fall in power prices that we've seen is going to make take about 5% off the NEV. The fund off 5%, 5p, 5p off the NEV. Um, what they've done is that um, they, they use external values just as everybody else does. And I think, and this is one of the things I, I, I want to do some more work on just to see where we are in terms of the cycle. I think it was sort of like any others in terms of uh, adjusting its power prices downwards. It's talking about 70% hit to previous estimates over five years, um, which is sort of front end loaded. So 20, 25%, 25% over the first, of the first couple of years, so 2020, 2021. Um, and then um, and then the balance to make up 70% over five years. And then a 5% cut to power price assumptions for the period from 2025 to 2050. Um, the reason why we see power prices are low at the moment is because of COVID and we shut in, there's no, the demands from off the cliff. Um, gas prices, which um, are the major influence on power prices in the UK because they're the big swing factor in, in their generation. Um, have been quite weak as you see there. What I've done basically is I've used off-gen figures but they only run to the um, beginning of the year and then I've stuck in the normal price for uh, yesterday um, so you can see where, where, where power prices and gas prices are. Um, this all sort of comes on top of um, the big fuss that we had uh, a couple of months ago now where um, JP Morgan and others were commenting on the study that um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance did, where they sort of saying that power prices are going to collapse because renewable energy is just going to cannibalise um, power prices and it's all going to be a disaster. Um, it's a possibility, but it's a remote possibility. Um, first off, the BNEF study was assuming um, all sorts of um, additional uh, cuts to the cost of solar and wind power um, beyond what's been achieved already. So there's been quite spectacular falls in the cost of installing this stuff um, over the past few years. But it, it, you talk to the uh, industry participants and they're saying that we're knocking on the edge of what's achievable with that. Um, I mean, people are talking about sort of Chinese dumping of um, solar panels and um, wind turbines and things. So it, it seems hard to me to, to see how the cost of that installation of these things is going to keep falling exponentially the way it has been. Um, and at the same time, um, I've even turned around and said, well, why would we as the renewable energy industry want to invest in new plants if we're not going to earn a return on it? And I think that's a very valid comment. Um, that doesn't mean to say that it's not a desirable thing from in terms of climate change and else that we don't invest more in power. But um, the, um, the government's done something interesting. They're, they're basically consulting now on, on how the subsidies will work uh, for the next round of uh, the CFD auction. Um, and they are talking about including solar and onshore wind again, um, having ruled out subsidies a few years ago. Um, the way this is going to work hasn't been ironed out yet. Um, they're going to design it in such a way that it doesn't cannibalise offshore wind because they, they because if it was the it were all three technologies set, um, set up together, then onshore and solar would, would win hands down. But um, it, it's interesting that they are talking about introducing subsidy, uh, reintroducing subsidy on in these technologies, and it, it's it's obviously answers the question because uh, then in terms of uh, renewable energy investor, yes, you can still get the returns um, because less of it will be coming from power prices and more of it will be coming from subsidies. So um, yeah, I, I think the, the sort of big fear on these things that 
power prices are totally coming down, but not to the extent that the NF is sort of just talking about. So, so um, having uh, been through all this, um, as we did last week, um, now is the time to uh, talk to um, our guest for this week, which is uh, Jonathan Maxwell. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, good to talk to you. Um, I, I've sort of stuck a few questions up here just to sort of a bit of a guide of what I want to talk about. Um, so, um, first off, can you just tell a little bit about how STCL came about? Because you've been going for quite a while before you launched yeah. the Energy Efficiency Fund. Yeah. So, what were the drivers to creating the business in the first place and how did it get put together? Great. Uh, well, look, first of all, thanks for inviting me to come on to your um, session this morning. Um, yeah, so STCL um, is uh, over 12 years old. So um, uh, the, 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 I founded the business um, back in 2007. Um, my background is I worked for um, HSBC on the infrastructure and real estate investment business which um, eventually was spun up to become infrared uh, just to join the dots I know you talked about trig um, recently um, so um, about sort of 2007 I was looking really hard at the future of infrastructure I was lucky enough to have had the job to um, design and float Hickel the HSBC infrastructure company limited back in 2006 um, so um, had done a lot of thinking about um, the infrastructure sector and you know the merits of long-term income investing availability contracts it's, you know very attractive but also the opportunity of delivering infrastructure services without which society can't function so um, you know fundamentally that was the concept behind social and social infrastructure back in 2006-7 um, but it occurred to me in 2007 that um, you know the other sort of thing that the you know the society doesn't function without is what I was thinking about as environmental infrastructure. So uh, Tickle was all about social infrastructure, sort of schools, hospitals, and the like. Um, you know where I was, I was very interested in two thousand and seven in the long term story associated with energy, particularly clean energy. Um, you know energy efficiency and other forms of infrastructure that were going to be important to ensure. You know that we can um, sort of get energy, water, waste moved around and dealt with um, over the long term. So in 2007, um, I took that idea to create um, this company called Sustainable Development Capital, or SDCL as an acronym. Um, and the sort of objective of the business really was to um, find ways of identifying investment opportunities in environmental infrastructure, um, and then ultimately start to invest in the sector where we could see. An opportunity to add value and do something different um, so we spent the first five or six years of our lives um, you know working in the markets sort of creating um, and advising on uh, new investment strategies fund financing sort of funds companies and doing quite a lot of work for government on the energy infrastructure sector and then in um, 2000 clean energy infrastructure sector I should say and then in 2012 we launched our first institutional fund and it was very much focused on there of the market that we felt um uh you know was a sort of niche area potentially um a funding gap um and i think you know um very very much a sort of a theme that we thought was here to stay and the theme really was that is that um you know clearly there's a tremendous amount of energy that's needed in uh economies um and um you know, if you break that down, about sort of 40%, the largest single component of it's actually of energy, of energy is used in buildings for one reason or another. Um, but I think the thing that fascinated me and us as a firm was that, um, you know, the, the uh, we found that the energy system really, as it's been designed, um, has been designed around relatively old technology. So um, centralized natural gas, um, you know, fossil fuel and then more recently um, centralized uh, renewable systems but there's quite a lot of loss and inefficiency in the way that the energy that's generated actually gets to buildings um, in fact we we're rather astonished to find that um, just over 62 percent of energy in the uk 
was lost somewhere in the tr generation and transmission and distribution <laughs> system before it got to the buildings themselves. Um, so we found that fac sort of fascinating um, gap there in terms of the inefficiency of supply um, of energy in the first place. And then the equally um, uh, you know, sort of fascinating but fiddly um, conundrum is that we found that if you looked at building performance, buildings were quite often losing about 25-30% of the energy that they were using. Uh, perhaps through inefficient lighting systems or sort of mechanical equipment or something like that. So, you know, the company, the, really the opportunity I identified was that surely there's a bit, there's a way of helping to deliver cleaner, more reliable energy solutions directly to buildings mm -hmm. and in helping those buildings reduce the demand for energy. Um, and coming back to the infrastructure investment model, um, you know, clearly providing on site generation or energy efficiency solutions, which were the solutions to those problems, would require an upfront capital cost, but could it then be effectively spread over the useful life of the assets and delivered like an infrastructure concession? So, this was the fundamental question we asked ourselves. In fact, everybody else we could talk to at the time in the market. And in 2012, we decided to launch a first fund, first institutional fund of its kind um, in the UK uh, as a private equity fund to invest in the theme. Um, we were backed by the British government in 2012 to do it. Um, and we launched a fund here in the UK, in the US, in Ireland, and also in Singapore over the subsequent two or three years. Um, we invested the capital in quite a broad range of projects um, in uh, Europe, North, North America, and Asia. Um, and the first portfolio of those projects in 2018 had come through from um, ideas into construction, into commissioned contracted concessions. Um, and it was with that portfolio, which is about 100 million of commitments, um, that we were able to use the, that portfolio really as a seed to create the company that exists on the London Stock Exchange today. So that's what created the STCL Energy Efficiency Income Trust. So you're really, you were sort of pioneers for this whole idea then. Uh, is there anybody else doing this apart from you? Well, Look, I think the, the energy efficiency sector, um, broadly defined, meaning on-site generation and, um, you know, and, uh, you know, sort of energy efficiency itself, demand reduction is a pretty big business. Um, uh, it, it has transformed during the period, um, you know, in which we've been investing. I think the answer to your question, by the way, is I think we're probably one of the larger, if not the largest, really specialist investors in this sort of space, on-site generation or energy efficiency as a financial investor. Uh, but as an overall industry, it's really grown pretty substantially. It's been around for a long time. You know, um, energy efficiency is not a new idea. I think it's just become more pertinent because the technology has become, um, you know, cleaner, more efficient. And um, I think the drivers for it, particularly driven by sort of the more recent um, intensity of interest in climate change and environment has really gone up a lot. Um, but I mean, if I give you the other feature of this is that um, it, although it's a big industry today, um, it was a little niche or narrow or even cottage when we got started. So in 2012, when we started investing in the first uh, LED or energy or sort of lighting efficiency projects, which seems completely obvious today, um, I banged my head against the wall trying to convince companies trying to change their light bulbs. I didn't understand why, because if you can take a lamp that uses six place it with a lamp that create that uses six watts to do the same job obviously there's a large amount of benefit from electrical and cost perspective but why didn't people do it well it was a simple answer looking in the rear view mirror because only two percent of the world's lights were efficient in 2012 now over 50 percent going on 60 percent of the world's lights were efficient so we're seeing this sort of huge change in the way that technology is deployed same with on-site generation and I would say that that gives see it as an investment company now an investable pool of assets uh, in which to you know, go after. These assets are very uh, less often owned by financial investors, more by you know uh, utilities, independent power producers, yeah. some energy related um, uh, investment uh, vehicles, and so on. But it does because you know as you say we were, because we're early movers, if not pioneers. Then you know we certainly understand these technologies well. Uh, which means that we're quite knowledgeable buyers of these uh, projects in the secondary market. Cool. Jade, just to um, uh, explain a bit about how the, the fund works, do you think maybe you could talk us through an individual investment, just, just sort of roughly and about, about um, how in practice, what you, what you pay for, what you do, 
Yeah. yeah. Well, look, if the, the, um, the, uh, the, the listed company, the SCCL Energy Efficiency Income Trust, um, is, is, is predominantly focused on investing in operating assets. As I said, I mean, the first sort of 100 million or so of commitments um, was acquired on day one um, with the seed portfolio that we've created since 2012. But since then, we've added um, a very large number of projects by number and value to the portfolio. So the total asset base of the company is now is um uh you know sort of plus or minus sort of 400 million um compared to 100 at ipo um we have uh 26 or 27 projects within the portfolio about a third of the assets are in the uk um uh, meaning pro sort of projects and cash about a third of the portfolio is in continental europe and about a third of the portfolio is in the united states um, the underlying sort of projects, most of them are on-site generation projects. So there we're using, um, instead of wasting energy through, um, you, know, uh, you know, dumping heat through generation losses or transmission or distribution losses in the system, we're gen Oh. Uh, so you're still there. I'm so sorry. I'm just, <laughs> inter are you still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Inter interruption on the, uh, on the line. Um, but we're, yeah, we're generating energy on site using, I mean, for example, from a small part of the portfolio, solar power. So we're doing solar, solar uh, rooftop solar, um, which is cost competitive for um, Tesco's in the UK. We're doing on site generation using waste gases that have been recycled from industrial processes like steel in the US. We're using um, green gas from biomass pr uh, production. We're using natural gas, albeit highly efficiently by highly efficiently by capturing the heat. So there's quite a lot of on-site generation, and then there's um, uh, and, and, and you know and that generation then produces energy uh, that is either electrical power or heat or cooling services to underlying clients um, under contract. And then the other type of project we have in the portfolio is just pure play reduction, energy reduction. Um, there is no such thing as zero carbon energy, but there is actually such a thing as zero carbon energy efficiency or even megawatts of generation that come out of energy efficiency. So it's a very interesting topic, not just financially, but from an environmental or carbon perspective. Um, so we, for, for example, the investment company owns all of the lights for Santander Bank in the UK. Um, we've actually previously we just worked it all the way through the portfolio and realized it but we we had financed all of the led installations for ncp car parks across the uk um, quite a lot of heating ventilation air conditioning projects um so you know by geography pretty well diversified and then i would say the other characteristic is and it sort of goes to your introduction and the news uh you know the other characteristic is that typically our projects are either availability or capacity based um we try as much as we can to uh, minimize or mitigate any exposure that we might have to power prices or commodity prices in our portfolio um, and try and sort of reduce our risk factors down to things that we can control, like making sure the equipment's available and operating. Um, so, you know, by and large, the strategy is designed to deliver a sort of a long term, stable, predictable, contracted cash flow by providing energy services which are critical. Mm -hmm. to um you know business and industry which is also critical and the last thing i'll say on that is as a result of that 23rd of march we put out a covid19 statement to tell people that we were still here but also what might be going on with our performance and um you know we were to, we we're able to say and we you know, haven't had to correct it that you know so far there are no specific covid19 um interruptions that are material to our current performance um you know i would be remiss not to say that we're dealing in an extremely sort of uh, difficult market environment globally but our strategy of providing sort of critical energy services to critical industry you know most of the steel mills we're operating for in the us are still running um most of the all of the energy that we're providing for um for example the food industry in spain uh, which has otherwise shut down business but obviously not food um is still going uh, we're clearly, as we're talking today, the data centers we service are still running at full pelt. The hospitals, I'm afraid, um, uh, demand isn't reducing at the moment. Um, so, you know, I think the business is as, about, as well positioned as it would be reasonable to expect any business would be in the current market environment. Cool. Okay, good. 
And you, it's 300 million market cap plus already. Um, how big could it get? Well, I mean, look, you know, if, if um, I think that's, there's a short and a long term story to that. I mean, the short term story is that, um, you know, right now we are seeing just as much interest in, um, you know, so there are three key things that we offer, really, one of which is cheaper energy, one of which is cleaner energy and the other one of which is secure energy because it's generated on site. Um, you know, and if we go through those themes, you know, clearly cost efficiency is hugely important. Um, and in fact, energy efficiency as a business tends to do quite well when there's a very significant focus on bottom line. Um, and actually, I think there's quite a significant focus on a lot, lots of different lines at the moment. But clearly, anything that can help to reduce cost is quite attractive. Um, so I think we are not seeing any let up in demand for projects that can cut energy costs. I think the second point is carbon. Um, and uh, I don't know what you're seeing, but generally speaking, um, there is, I don't think that, you know, the current crisis is a headwind for sustainability or climate. If anything, I think it's pushing up. Um, I made a facetious comment that we're, if we're losing three trillion, to coronavirus at the moment, then it might just be the tip of the iceberg compared to environment and climate change. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, we're certainly not seeing any let up in demand. So for example, um, the big drivers of demand, like the data center providers, I mean, these guys will not do anything unless it's carbon neutral, nothing. I mean, it's more important to them than money, I'm afraid. So, you know, we're finding that the, the, the carbon story is pretty enduring and maybe even have a tailwind behind it at the moment. And then I think the last point is security. And um, we're operating in a lockdown environment. Um, but even before that, the UK grid provides enough power for the market, but not that much more, um, to be honest. And, and, and there have been some constraints and we all, we've all lived through the blackouts over the last year or two um, and emergency power markets and so on. Um, so I think there is a significant focus on security. So all those three are tailwinds. Uh, that, so and th those tailwinds will get, will get us through. Um, I would say with confidence, those tailwinds will get us through the current, um, you know, very very difficult trading environment. Um, I think what happens when we get out afterwards, and um, we think that I think that this market is set for a very very substantial growth. Um, I think see it's in a great position because it's a very good owner of assets. It's yeah. very experienced and, um, you know, I think it could get, I mean, we've said publicly, we think it can get to, you know, 500 to a billion plus, um, you know, I think in terms of, um, you know, uh, but, but clearly, you know, we're focused on making sure that our capital is well placed rather than on scale on its own. But uh, we're, 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 we're at a reasonable size today and we'd, we'd seek to continue to grow the company to, to improve EBIT diversification and marketability and liquidity for our share. Cool. Okay. That's a good story. Um, right, let's open it up for questions. Um, so if you've got a question uh, and you're um, just calling in, the easiest thing to do is just to email me on jcapartmentco.com. If uh, you're doing it through Ring Central, then uh, by all means just uh, send me a question through the chat function. That's probably the easiest way. And so let's just pause a minute and see what we've got. Um, I've got a question here for Jonathan. So how much of the portfolio is exposed to companies that are not not operating? I suppose to, sure compa to companies that are not operating. Not operating. Uh, um, so um, a very small proportion of our portfolio, uh, and, and the, the, I have to say, obviously, we're a public company, so disclosure yeah. is always going to be an issue. Okay. An issue but I, I, I can, I can certainly give you sort of a, an answer to the question anyway. Um, a, a, a small proportion of our portfolio is invested, so it's about four or five percent, in a very, very well diversified set of asset-backed loans. Is probably the best way to describe them in the U.S. Um, so we have um, we provide the, the portfolio provides uh, I mean, in, in, in shorthand leases for equipment like 
uh, lights, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, insulation, so on, to about 200, through 264 contracts in 36 states in the US. So it's about $20, 20 million dollar investment when we made it, $22 million. So somewhere within that portfolio, <laughs> you're gonna have some interruptions. Um, so far, um, we haven't seen anything, and we, we're very unlikely, in my view, to see anything that would be material to our performance because it's a small part of the portfolio. Um, but you know, within that, um, it's a sort of company which is um, called Spark Fund. It's a, it's, it's a developer, not a fund, but it's providing services to all sorts of companies, you know, including things like cinemas, which aren't very operable at the moment. But you know, it doesn't. I don't think there's any. We're not expecting any sort of material adverse performance. Uh, but just for completeness, you could impute. But looking at our portfolio, that if you look over there, you might find some interruptions in operations I, I i actually i wouldn't be able to tell you today um the answer to the question for regulatory reasons but it, it uh, what i can say from a sort of operational perspective is it's not material in terms of stopped operations um the companies that are operating within the rest of the portfolio are in the public domain uh, we've got um ArcelorMittal in the us us steel uh, we have a series of um, olive uh, industrial um producers in um, Spain, we have um, data centers, banks, uh, hospitals. Those companies today and industries today are all operating, yeah. um, uh, all of them. Um, now, uh, you know, individual assets uh, within an industrial facility, um, you know, may from time to time, you know, be switched on and off depending on demand loads or the sort of economics. But all of the businesses, to answer the specific question that's been raised, all the businesses and industry, industrial counterparties that we're servicing um, today are operating as businesses. Um, uh, so, um, you know, so, and, and, you know that, that, that is, that's not an accident totally. You know, we've, we're very, very focused on the credit counterparty exposure. And coming back to the sort of the trite way I describe this, it's, we provide, what we look for is providing critical energy to critical industry. So yeah, when the US go, sh shuts down, um, you know, it's no accident that you know the, the key revenue driver for us in the US is ArcelorMittal's most important steel mill in the US, um, with the most important blast furnace. It's the most cost competitive, and that would have been sort of part of our underwriting thesis. Yeah. Uh, so so in Spain, um, the King of Spain shut down all business in Spain, but he hasn't shut down the food industry because you can't. Um, uh, you shouldn't and um you know therefore as we're providing energy services to the olive industry it's keeping going um but i, I i'm not you know i'm not being facetious this is the, you know, the current market environment is incredibly challenging um and we have some operation and maintenance um uh contingencies and sort of uh, uh change you know sort of adaptations that we've had to make across the portfolio to deal with the current environment um but uh, you know what I'm pleased to say is so far uh, it's been fine uh, and manageable. All those contingencies have worked. And then just for completeness, you know, a couple of uh, about six percent of our portfolio, Keith is on the line, I think, is currently exposed to projects which are either going through commissioning or, or construction. Right. Clearly, there is some slowdown on uh, one or two of those situations given lockdown um, situations. But um, you know, again, uh, so far nothing that's material to our performance. Cool. Okay, good. Um, Tim, question. Do, does Seek pay all of its income out as dividends? Um, it, so, so see it, um, it's, it's, it, that's a more complicated question. Um, <laughs> so see it has, a, 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 in, 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 in a typical year, see it actually has a relatively high level of cash that it, that, that it, that it receives, mm -hmm. say relative to typical infrastructure, because the contracts in typical infrastructure are a bit longer, so they're 20 years, say, plus or minus, um, whereas our contracts are typically 11 or 12 years. So what that means is for the same IRR, you get quite a lot of cash um, in any given year. Um, what we then have to do is make sure that we sort of distinguish between what cash we're getting in, you know, is capital versus income. Yeah. And then what we seek, seek to do is to make sure that our dividend is covered by at least expected income for the year um and that uh, you know it's, it's usually cash isn't usually an issue for us it's just more about sort of making sure that we we, we have a um you know good prospect for earnings cover yeah. so the short story is at the moment um 
uh, yes, um, uh, I would say what from a, from an earnings perspective as a policy, we expect that we're probably going to be paying out a decent proportion of our earnings as income. But it, but we have a substantially higher proportion of cash flow in any typical given year compared to our earnings. Okay, that makes sense. And um, where does your pipeline of projects come from? Um, so um, the, to, to, we we actually sort of generate some projects ourselves um so for example you know we do some um direct negotiated uh projects where we design uh solutions for companies directly for them um uh so for example um you know I, probably within that context although it was a sort of project that tesco's bid out um you know the, our relationship with tesco's has become one where we um literally design and then install uh, on-site generation solutions for them so we're not buying assets in that particular case we're building them very quick to build so that's one sort of thing where we sort of engage with directly with an end customer proactively and we've built over the years very wide group of relationships with big corporate industrial and public sector clients um, i'd say the, the rest of it um, is typically um, utilities or independent power producers or um, sometimes energy funds that own an IPP or an independent power producer that are selling operating assets and in those cases um, you know we participate in um, you know either sort of bilaterally negotiated or even sort of limited scope um, uh, sales processes in uh, in order to acquire assets so the, of the four five deals we did last year I would say um, two were privately negotiated bilateral transactions with IPPs or developers that we knew very well. One was a, a development we put together ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other two were um, M&A processes that we participated in. Um, um, uh, so it, 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 it's a variety of sources, but it's usually a disposal of non-core assets by an IPP or utility or an energy company of some description, or it's been generated by us. Okay, so are you, are you ever a kind of in a sort of auction situation? Uh, and if are we ever in a? Sorry, are we ever in a in a in kind of auction situation where, where you're um, you're you're bidding for a, a deal? Or um, yes, um, but only where we feel we've got an angle. Okay. Um, so um, we've actually been quite successful in those auction situations. We 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 we, um, we 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 have a limited appetite for going into highly competitive auctions where it's a very commoditized um, asset and it's very simple. So, for example, an area where we're just not successful is if we start to sort of participate in large-scale hot auctions for commercial and industrial solar projects in the U.S. I mean, that's that's quite commodity stuff, and the returns profile doesn't get as where we want to for for our shareholders. Um, we will participate if it is a technology application, which is, if not more complex, at least there's a high perceived complexity. So things like cogeneration or a mix of technologies or some form of energy services contract where it matters to the underlying client who owns the contract. So I, I think it, 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 it's, um, we, we participate in auctions, yes, but on a case by case basis. And it's specifically where we feel we've got a real added value that we can bring to the table. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how it's played out. Um, I guess of the two auctions we won last year, one was you know, reasonably well contended, um, but we had the advantage of being able to be a long-term investor and a single off-taker rather than acting in, in a, as a consortium between you know, half private equity and a half operator because um, we kind of, the two together, which is helpful. Yeah. Um, and then in the other case, um, uh, I think, you know, we were dealing in a situation where, um, you know, we were able to, 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 to negotiate a, um, a deal that worked well for us and well for the vendor. In fact, we acquired 50% of the company rather than 100% of the company, which is what we did with primary energy. Um, so it's pretty selective. Um, okay. So the answer is yes, but, um, yeah. you know, so where we think we can get a good price. Are you up against banks in those sort of situations? What sort of other, uh, who, who the sort of competition? Yeah, so, so um, again, it, it depends on the, on, it depends on the um, commoditization of the asset. So uh, we come, not so much banks, but we come across some specialist infrastructure or private equity sometimes. 
um, and if the yield gets chased too low, we're totally fine not to win those auctions, um, uh, candidly. Um, uh, but more often, we're coming up against, um, in, in the US, sometimes utilities. Um, and we have the advantage with it of being a bit quicker, having less regulatory baggage bringing to the table than a utility might do. Um, so it's you, it, you know what what we do requires a sort of certain degree of knowledge and expertise and industrial understanding. Um, so you know, the the utilities have that. Um, as I said, otherwise it's really a matter of putting more more like putting sort of private equity infrastructure together with an operator, and that's quite a complex situation for a vendor or even an underlying customer. So um, see it today is is quite well positioned, I think, when it's coming to these sorts of. Um, uh, acquisitions so uh, yeah the competition is there but it and which we want it to be and it, it's um uh you know but but on the other hand it, you know we have a we're, we're able to win where we've got a competitive advantage cool okay um i think that's the, the end of all the questions so thanks very much jonathan that's really quite interesting and um thank you everybody else to uh for listening in and um we'll see you next week thank you very much bye-bye thank you